the gospel, those things that pertain to what God did for us, we never could do for ourselves. And then we see that we are expected to meet the terms of pardon set out in the gospel, that there may be appropriated to us all those things that God has done for us to save our souls from sin. There is no one thing that saves our soul from sin. You can say the Bible saves us. You can say the gospel saves us. You can say the grace of God saves us. So many things the Bible mentions, such as faith saving us. The thing that I want to emphasize today is the blood of Jesus Christ. So I call this the blood that speaks of better things. The whole idea behind this, as far as the object of this lesson, is to help every one of us understand the importance, significance, and seriousness of the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. As great as Abraham was, as great as the Apostle Paul was, they were in need of the forgiveness of sins. And as much as the Bible upholds them as dedicated, faithful servants of God, they had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As is said in Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. God had to do something that was beyond our power to do so we could be saved from our sins. Now, He created us free moral agents. He created us with intelligence and with a rational mind. We can take in the evidence, reason with it, and draw a correct conclusion. God has supplied us with the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final, and complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, to communicate to us all the things that God's done for us to save us, and then to show us how to appropriate those things to our lives by learning and then exercising our human will to choose to do God's will. Now, today, I would like for us to be, begin by noticing, although we'll not read all of these verses now, but back in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, where we have the account of Cain and Abel, sons of Adam and Eve. We have also the fact that Cain's sacrifice was not according to the will of heaven, and thus God rejected it. Abel's was according to the teaching of God, and his was accepted. In time, Cain became very angry at his brother and killed him. And now we begin at the point that ties in with our lesson. Abel's blood is pictured by the inspired Moses as crying from the ground unto God for vengeance. That's how God put it. And we see that God heard that cry and he acted upon it. As you read the text, you know then that God consequently punished Cain for this terrible transgression. Now you hold that in the back of your mind and go with me to Hebrews 12, verses 22 through 24. Now this is where we obtain the title of this lesson, The Blood That Speaks of Better Things. I will call your attention, as I have many times in going to the letter of the, to the Hebrews. They were Christians who were Jews. They were under persecution. Because of that, they were thinking about leaving the whole Christian system. You might say just removing the New Testament from your Bible and going back to things under the law. Thus, the book of Hebrews compares and contrasts the law of Moses with the much, much better law of Christ or New Testament of Christ and even the Savior himself being far greater than he who was a type of a Savior and that was Moses. So in Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, the inspired writer said, But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, in the Greek it means the firstborn ones, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, 
and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Well, now you notice we mentioned a while ago about Cain and Abel and the death of Abel. But here's something that speaks better than that of Abel. In comparing the old covenant with the new, the inspired Hebrews writer speaks of two bloods. The blood of sprinkling concerning which he speaks is different to that of Abel's blood. Abel's blood cried out for vengeance to God, but the blood of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, cries out for the salvation of sinful mankind, for that's the reason the New Testament proclaims in many places that it was shed. Even today, in properly observing the Lord's Supper, there is the fruit of the vine. The bread represents the body and the fruit of the vine represents the blood Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. And we commemorate his death each first day of the week. And that first day of the week assembly is one of the five acts of worship showing forth his death till he come again. So Jesus' blood speaketh better than that of Abel's. Abel's dead blood, if you please, cried out unto God from the dust of the ground. How much more shall the living blood of Jesus Christ shed upon the cross for the remission of sins, cry unto God for salvation to those who seek its cleansing power. And apart from it, there is no remission. The whole law of Moses system had countless sacrifices of innocent animals to remind the people that when you sin, it costs the life of something not even responsible for your sins. If they had in their minds what God intended for them to have in their minds when they made those animal sacrifices, then they would see there something costing an animal's life, and that was their own sin. Yet the writer of Hebrews would say the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Therefore, for that 1,500 years, the law was the way that Israel approached God. It was constantly impressing upon them that you need a Savior. You cannot save yourself. No group of you can save yourselves. Somebody must save you. And when you read the book of Hebrews, you will see Christ held up above and beyond all things as the one to save men from sin. As he himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So look at the blood that speaks of better things. And you'll see that the blood speaks of better things concerning the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, and Acts chapter 2. The church sometimes is denigrated. In fact, as far as I know, most denominations say it has nothing to do with any man's salvation. That's not what the New Testament teaches. Because when I read the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2, everyone that was baptized for the remission of sin was a believer who had heard the gospel and they heard the terms of pardon. They repented of their sins, Acts 2, verse 38, and they were baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission or forgiveness of their sins. And the Lord added them to the church. Now there's a reason for that. If you look at Paul's statement to the Ephesian elders, as Luke records in Acts 20 and verse 28, you'll learn that the church was purchased by the blood of Christ. Now question, was the blood shed on the cross of Calvary for the remission of forgiveness of our sins? Was it shed for something that was unnecessary? Was not important? Indeed, the church is worth the purchase price. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, Paul said to the elders, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now since the church was purchased by the blood, then each member of the Lord's church had to be purchased by the blood of Christ. Thus, when you find Paul writing to the church at Rome, and you get down to chapter 6, he reminds them of what they believed and what they did in becoming Christians. He did that to motivate them to greater faithful service. And what does he tell us in the first part? 
He said you were buried with the Lord in baptism. You were baptized into his death. Why his death? Why well, was in his death Christ shed his blood? Thus we're cleansed by the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism. Did the waters themselves as H2O have a thing in the world to do with cleansing sin? Not directly. Water cannot cleanse from sin. But there's water in the plan. There's water in the plan. Anybody that can go back over to 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Kings chapter 5 and read of the cleansing of Naaman knows that Naaman had an incurable disease. To make a long story short, the prophet through his servant told him to dip seven times in the river Jordan and that disease would be cured. When he got down off his high horse, literally and figuratively, and settled himself through the persuasion of his servants, he went and dipped seven times. It wasn't after the first time or the third time or the sixth time, but only when he had completed his obedience. When he rose from the waters of Jordan the seventh time, his flesh came to him as a little child. The water had nothing in the world to do with it as far as literal water, but it was his faith and obedience to God's will in doing what God said do in the way God said do it and for the reason God said do it that God cleansed him of his sins. And when people today hear the good gospel of Jesus Christ, they are led to faith in Christ by it, Romans 10, 17. They believe in Christ, John 3, 16. They repent of their sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess their faith in the Christ. They're qualified then to be buried with their Lord in baptism because in that burial, the blood of Christ is applied and they rise to walk in newness of life. So Paul would say, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. What? A form of teaching. What is it? The death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. You obeyed that form of doctrine. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of of righteousness well they contacted the blood that Christ shed on the cross no man today can go back to the actual cross with the body of Christ on it with the blood running down and stand done under it and have the blood fall on him then go with the dead body into the tomb and come out of it on the first day of the week but you can obey a form of it you can obey a form of the doctrine and out of faith built upon it thus saith the Lord proposition then you can obey your Lord's from the heart to salvation. So the church is purchased by the blood. Thus each member is purchased by the blood. For it takes the individual members to make up the collective church of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. It would be so wonderful. It would remove a great amount of problems from your life and mine. If we would remember we do not belong to ourselves. We're not here to do as we please. We're not here to do as other men think we ought to do. We're here to do as the New Testament of Christ directs us to do. So whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now he that lied or told the truth. James 1 verse 27 or 25. So we need to understand that. Then you come to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 5, 9. And you see those saved. And it says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the, thy blood, thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Thus the gospel, the power of God to save, is to be preached to every creature on the earth. Mark 16, 15. So who do we belong to? We belong to Christ. First, foremost, and always. If you want to sum up what the Bible teaches, it is the revelation of God's will pertaining to the salvation of the souls of men through Jesus Christ and His gospel to the glory of God the Father. And that pretty well sums it up. Reconciliation, a great word, occurs in the church. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. No other way. Paul wrote to the church, the city of Ephesus, Ephesians 2, verses 13 through 19. And he said in those words, but now in Christ Jesus. Where? In. In what? In Christ Jesus. Ye who sometimes 
or far off, or made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In other words, that was the old law of Moses. It kept Gentile and Jew apart. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that means hate, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances. That's the law of Moses. For to make in himself of two one new man in making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. And Colossians 1.18 says that one body is the church. Having slain the hate or enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh or near. How? Through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and the household of God. Paul tells us the household of God is the church. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. So you're made one in Christ and reconciled to God by the blood of Christ. In the spiritual body of Christ which is God's family. Which is the church. We also see in Revelation 5, 9. Them singing this new song saying. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, as we read a moment ago, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Why the church is not a segregated institution, we sometimes sing with our little children down here. The first part of our singing we have once a month. We sing with them the song, Red and Yellow, Black and White. They are precious in His sight. Well, it's not just the little children. Christ died for all men. Paul said plainly in Acts 17, that he made of one blood all the nations. While we may look different, we may sound different, but we're all human beings. We just have different chassis. <laughs> That's just what it comes down to. We all, though have sinned, Romans 3, 23, we all need forgiveness of sins, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. And our Lord, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, shed his blood for the remission of our sins. All men then may be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ by following the teaching of the New Testament as to how to reach the blood of Christ. And we've already touched on that. We must remember that the church is described also as a priesthood, but it's a priesthood through the shed blood of Christ. Hebrews, we go again, chapter 10 and verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Under the old system of the law, the priests took the animals, they killed them, they burned them before they went into the holy place of the tabernacle. They washed first at the laver, and then they went in to do what only the priest of the tribe of Levi could do. Well, today, the temple is the church, and each member thereof is a priest, for we were washed in the blood of the Lamb through obedience to the gospel as we studied a moment ago. And thus we're able, as priests ourselves, to do the work of God. And we pray through our high priest, who is Jesus himself, who's gone actual to the true holy of holies, based upon his own life and blood, and stands ever ready to make intercession for us. And he's the only mediator between God and man. Only the priest could enter the holy his place of the tabernacle. Priests were dedicated with blood. All of that was trying to tell the Jews there's one coming who will actually take away sins. All of this was to be training them. If they'd understood it right, they all would have received Christ when he came, but they didn't. And those priests in the Levitical priesthood were dedicated with blood. And if you're a Christian, and all that Christian means, you're dedicated with blood, the blood of Christ. Peter speaks of our priesthood saying, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, which here means a purchased people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were, no, were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but listen, but now have obtained mercy. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Think about it for a while. We want the mercy of God. We know that we stand condemned before God in our sins. Thus, if we benefit from the mercy of God, we must receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. For it's the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. 
and we receive it with meekness, with humility, as it is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 17. How powerful is that Word? Well, the writer of Hebrews again says in Hebrews 4, 12, now the sword of the Spirit, or the Word of God, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why Paul said, preach the word. Honest-hearted people, Luke 8, 15, will take it and understand it. It'll probe their inward being. It'll make them see themselves as God sees them. Then they must be honest with themselves and decide whether they're going to obey it or they're going to continue in sin. The blessings of the church are only to those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And such is referenced in Revelation 7 and verse 14, the verses following. The blood that speaks of better things speaks of then forgiveness of sins or salvation. In Romans 3, 24 through 25, Paul said to the church at Rome, being justified freely by his grace, that's the favor of God we don't deserve. We cannot do anything to make God pay us with it. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Now, the prerequisite to salvation is faith, which God has always demanded of his people. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Please keep in mind that faith has been essential in the patriarchal age, the mosaical age, and to us. Faith is always formed by the word of God because it contains the evidence that proves whatever it is we need to believe. God does not ask us just to say, well, there it is. He gives us adequate evidence and credible witnesses. He proves it. Thus, we're taught to prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. And we can do that. This word propitiation is something which satisfies or appeases. The blood of Jesus Christ satisfied God's demand for a sacrifice that would forgive sin. We would do well not then to take these things for granted because we may use the terms or phrases blood of Christ so much because what if Christ did not shed his blood? There would be no remission. We just noticed back up here in Romans 3 verse 25 that emphasized that very point. In 1 John 2 and verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ died for all. This is the ultimate manifestation of God's love for every one of us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 reads, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. What about redemption? In Ephesians 1, 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to to the riches of His grace. The idea of redemption is that I am under the power of sin. I need to be redeemed from that. What does that mean? Well, I'm a slave to sin. I'm lost. I cannot of myself free myself. So Christ did it for me. He made it possible for me to be relieved of all my sins, cleansed of all my sins, all my sins wiped away, to be able to stand before God as if I'd never sinned. And that's all by the blood of Christ, Revelation 5, 9. Redemption means simply to buy back. Christ paid the price for our soul's salvation with his own precious blood. Now, with that said, let me ask you a question about yourself. How much value do you place on your soul? Now, think about what we just said. How much value does God Almighty who created you place on your soul? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That tells us the worth of our soul. Other passages do the same thing. How much would a man give for his soul? You can accumulate or attempt to all your days on this earth, whether they're long or sh short. 
but they're going to pass away. Everything you can experience through your five senses is going to all be burned up. The late Marshall Keeble said one time after he'd been out here in Texas further west, and a rancher who was a member of the church and owned, as they would say, a big spread, had to take him up an airplane to show him all of it. When he got down, he said, well, Brother Keeble, what do you think of all this? Brother Keeble simply responded with, God's going to burn it all up. And yet there's where we put most of our hope, most of our time, most of our mental concerns is on what God's going to burn up. Forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. How could language be clearer? And yet that kind of language is multiplied throughout the New Testament. How can we reach the blood of Christ? Have we not already satisfied that with the scriptures? We're baptized into the death of Christ as a believer who's repented of sins. And in that obedience to the gospel and being buried with our Lord in baptism, Romans 6, 3, and 4, the blood washes away our sins. The blood of Christ gives us access to heaven. We started this sermon off based upon even the song we had just sung about heaven, how different it's going to be there, how radically different it will be from this life. There will be no more need for forgiveness of sins. Think about that. There will be no more guilty consciences. There will be no more need of repentance of sins. There will be no more need of confessing sins and praying God forgiveness. Nothing will be there as it is here. This is fleshly and passing. Sin dominates here. Pain and anguish is everywhere. Concerns. Fighting the fight of faith is a daily fight. And learning how to do it. But in heaven it won't be so. So the writer of Hebrews in chapter 9 verses 14 and 15 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serving the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Are you in somebody's will going to receive what they have now after they're dead and gone, whether it's little or much? Well, some of you may know you are, and some may not. The point is... God has promised us glory and majesty far beyond our minds to grasp regarding this life. No matter how good you've had it in the flesh, no matter how well you've lived a godly life here, this life is full of tribulations and hardships, fights and ups and downs, sickness and all kinds of things like that because sin dominates this world. Satan's the prince of this world. But if we use it like God intended, it becomes a schoolroom whereby we serve God and we pass all the tests because we solve them with the word of truth. And thus we can face that standard on the day of judgment, having lived faithful to it and hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Whatever we suffer here on earth then will pale into insignificance. And there will loom before us the marvels and amazing views of heaven itself. For we'll even be a part of it. Raised to glory in a body like our Lord presently has. To walk the streets of gold. In Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest. By the blood of Christ. By a new and living way. Which hath consecrated us through the veil. That is to say. His flesh. You see, he's pointing those folks who are weak in the faith, who are thinking about giving up the New Testament system and the gospel, going back under the law of Moses. No, this is the only way there is. That was pointing to what you now have. You give this up, you're going backwards, and there is no hope. Revelation 12 and verse 11, And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. When we're attached to this world, to this flesh, to this material creation, we won't like things like that because our hopes and aspirations have been anchored here. But for those who have denied themselves, have denied the flesh, who've overcome the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, who always answer things with the thus saith the Lord, who view everything in the light of the truth, then these things are but passing 
troubles that we must go through. They're just simply here to get us ready for our long home eternity. The blood that speaks of better things speaks of our responsibility. Our Lord did much to show that we're here to walk in His footsteps to serve others according to His will. In Hebrews 9, 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot or, uh, to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's why I'm here. That's why you're here, is to serve God. Sometimes we lose sight of that in the church. We start serving ourselves and do all sorts of things along that way. And we forget we're to serve God. And as we serve God, we keep His commandments. And that means we know how to deal with one another and solve all things, beginning in our own personal lives, then our own families, then in the church, as the Lord wants it solved. We must be willing to serve as the one who shed the blood that saves us. Serve, faithful unto death. We must warn those who reject the gospel. Here's what's going to happen to you. Just read through the New Testament and see how Paul and other writers warn people that if they don't stay with the truth they've obeyed or if those who do not obey it, it's what's going to happen to them. So you warn people when it comes to them rejecting the only way of salvation. Hebrews 10, 28 and 29, here's how the writer of Hebrews did it. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now think about it. Of how much sore er punishment suppose ye? Shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? When you stop living like the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty teaches you to live, whether it's in one aspect of it or denying the whole thing or anything in between, then you're doing despite under the spirit of grace. You are not counting the blood of the covenant for what it really is, and as we've studied it in this sermon. Under the old law, there was no mercy shown. You sin, you die. But under the new law, men have more time to repent. In fact, Peter said, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, that it is promised to return at the end of the world, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Those who have been given greater opportunity, you think about this, those who have been given greater opportunity shall be judged harsher because they reject the blood of Christ under that greater opportunity. Sometimes we don't think about that aspect of the judgment when we say, well, the New Testament is the standard whereby we'll be judged. John 12, 48, that's right. But you have greater opportunity here to know your Bible than you would if you were born in a lot of places in this world. And though God's saying, what are you doing with it? There's our problem in America. What am I doing with all these freedoms we claim we love and have and we're willing to defend and we're all upset and the people are trying to break them down? What are we doing with it? Well, a whole lot of folks who are hollering about that aren't using to learn the Bible to spread the gospel. I don't know what they're worried about if they were restricted completely by some government like the Nazis or communist government. They'd do just about as much then as they are now with all the freedoms. So what's it all about? What are you going to do with all these freedoms on the Constitution as members of the church of our Lord? And you're doing right now what you'd do with it otherwise. Hebrews 13, 11 through 5, For the bodies of those beasts under the law of Moses, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary of the high priest, for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Look at the conclusion the writer draws. Let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. In other words, there's nothing abiding here. There's nothing permanent here. Your health's not permanent. Some of you now may be feeling quite well. Tomorrow you may be dead. You don't know. If we could just keep our mind thinking that way, 
the sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof because this is all we've got is today. Oh, we make all these plans for tomorrow and next month and this fall and what we're going to do and not do. How many people are doing that right along with us now? They won't be here tomorrow. And listen to me. Some day it will be our turn to plan and not be here tomorrow. Today is all we have. So how does one contact the blood of Jesus? Well, I send you back to Romans 6. For there the Holy Spirit told those people what they did in becoming Christians to motivate them to greater faithful service in the church. The blood is the cleansing agent in baptism. The water's not. The blood is. Because you can't contact the blood unless you're buried in the water. That's so important, so important for us to realize. Now if you're in the church, are you a thriving, faithful member of the church full of good works? as the New Testament authorizes you to be. Over all these years that I've tried to preach the gospel, I've watched people from congregation to congregation. I've talked to other preachers, and it's the same thing there. I visit with other faithful members at various capacities of service in the church, and you'll find out in every congregation, large or small, there are those people who live for this world who just can't get it out of their system. And they're not growing and developing in knowledge of the truth in concern for lost souls. And so I fear it shall ever be. But it shouldn't be. And those who have a heart easily touched and moved by the word of the living God, you can change all that because you're a free moral agent. But your want to has got to be there. Your love for the Lord must be there. And your faith in his system of salvation must be there. If you're not a child of God, we've studied what to do to become one. As a child of God, have you sinned? Have you done despite to the blood of Christ? Have you not really lived like a member of the church purchased by the blood of Christ? Do you remember when you were baptized and how much you rejoiced in it? You rose that watery grave of baptism, rejoicing as a faithful child of God, a new creature in Christ. Now what's hindering you, if any? Consider your life along with the Word as God searches your heart. And if you see sin in it, we beg of you to repent of those sins. Come confessing them. We'll pray with you and for you that your sins be forgiven. And the great thing about it is, God wants you forgiven. God wants you in heaven with him. And he stands ready to forgive as we approach him on his own terms in submission to his will. If you're subject then to the call of Jesus, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.